Uh, we have been putting this series on in partnership with Trailhead and Tim Rostegar, the executive director at Trailhead, uh, for several weeks. And our goal is to connect uh, businesses, startups, entrepreneurs in the ecosystem with the resources, information, and people that they need not only to survive uh, these challenging times, uh, but also to, to come out with the ability uh, to thrive on the other side. Um, so we have an amazing panel of, of leaders here with us today, and I'll just introduce each of them, and then uh, we will jump right into the discussion because I'm sure that you are here uh, to listen to them and not to me. Uh, so first up, um, we have Boise's 56th mayor, uh, Mayor Lauren McLean. Uh, mayor McLean is a graduate of Notre Dame and of Boise State uh, and is someone you see all over town, and if you're like me, uh, you have the good luck to run across uh, Mayor McLean at Dry Creek, uh, way up in the Boise foothills, and it's someone I, I often see out in the foothills. So thank you for joining us today, Mayor McLean. Thanks, it's good to be here. Uh, second up, we have Dr. Tommy Alquist. Uh, Dr. Alquist is not only a physician uh, with years of experience in the ER, uh, but has really played a, a key role in transforming the Treasure Valley, uh, Boise skyline and, and many other communities uh, in the Treasure Valley, um, as well as leading innovations in healthcare and, and other projects. And in addition to all this, um, Dr. Alquist has been leading Crush the Curve, uh, an effort of multiple businesses and, and community partners uh, focused on the pandemic. Uh, and I think uh, has been watching The Last Dance as closely uh, as me and others, uh, kind of the nostalgia of what's happening with uh, the, the old Bulls teams. Uh, so just like to welcome uh, Dr. Alquist to the panel as well. Thanks, Nick. I didn't know you were old enough to appreciate that, so. <laughs> I am, and uh, it's been pretty fun. Uh, last, but certainly not least, uh, president Marlene Trump, um, Boise State's seventh president, uh, originally from rural Wyoming and a native Westerner, uh, comes to us most recently from UC Santa Cruz and Arizona State, uh, who have both been recognized for the innovation that they embody in higher education. She's bringing that can-do attitude and energy uh, to Boise State and is also a heck of a Twitter follow uh, if you haven't found her yet. Uh, so please help me in welcoming President Trump uh, to the conversation today. And thank Thanks, you for joining us. So glad to be here. Great. Um, so the, the discussion today is leadership during a crisis uh, and we're going to hear uh, from three panelists about how they're approaching an unprecedented situation, uh, as well as talk about some tips and action items uh, that our entrepreneurs and business community can take away from today's discussion. Uh, so to open it up, uh, I'm going to hand it off to TM Rostegar, uh, the executive director at Trailhead and our partner in all of this. Thanks, Nick. Hi everyone, TM Rastegar here with Trailhead Boise. Uh, special thanks to our audience and our panelists for joining us today. As you can see, we have a very special lineup for you and lots to cover. So I'm gonna just jump right into it. Um, before I start our discussion with, with the first question, I'd like to take a brief moment and just acknowledge um, today's sponsors. So first of all, we have Vinyl as a repeat sponsor. They are Boise's premier software development agency. Two of their partners, uh, Nick Krabs and Eric Herring, joined a previous episode for, of Survive to Thrive as panelists. And they like what we're doing so much that they took the initiative and reached out and offered to sponsor this going forward. Um, so I wanna thank the entire Vinyl family for their support. Um, I also wanna acknowledge the fact that um, Vinyl contributes greatly towards Boise Startup Week and the overall entrepreneurial ecosystem. And with that, our second sponsor for today is KeyBank. And uh, while I am Thank the you key for ITS service desk. A little disruption. Um, while I am the human banner for vinyl today, I have a vinyl shirt. I don't have a KeyBank shirt. And so instead, I just wanted to share a brief story uh, regarding KeyBank. As, as some of you may know, KeyBank is a, is a partner of Trailhead. 
and they um, partnered with us on a program called You Lead Idaho. Um, that program allowed us to reach rural high schools in Idaho and teach those students um, entrepreneurship. Um, we were able to bring those students actually to Boise and they uh, participated in the Boise State High School Idaho Entrepreneurial Challenge. And um, you know, with that partnership, we weren't, Trailhead wasn't really a client of KeyBank. All that to say that as a brand new client um, to KeyBank, they helped us secure our triple P loan um, during the initial phase of the release of the triple P. And as a relatively small nonprofit and a new client to KeyBank, and then being a large national bank, I just wanted to give them a shout out and thank them for treating us just like they treated every other client of theirs. And so with that, Let's jump into it. Um, today's theme, as, as Nick alluded to, is leadership and entrepreneurial thinking. And in, in a business environment that has been heavily disrupted by COVID-19, it is more important than ever to learn best practices and lessons learned from resilient leaders like you. And our ultimate goal with Survive the Thrive, as Nick said, is to give entrepreneurs in our ecosystem access to this combined knowledge and experience um, of you, our panelists. So with that, our first question, Tommy, this is for you. Um, our audience is very interested in your perspective. <clears throat> you're a medical doctor, you're a successful entrepreneur with Salter and BAV, and we've all watched you take charge with the Crush the Curve initiative. So the question I wanna to pose to you is, how does Tommy Alquist apply entrepreneurial thinking in identifying problems and solutions in this crisis? Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. And um, it's, it's nice to be with uh, President Trump and, and Mayor McLean. Um, you know, it's not been too long ago that we went through another crisis, which was the financial crisis in 08, the Great uh, Recession. And I'll tell you, I learned a lot during that recession. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about my company. I learned a lot about um, how to, how to survive and thrive in, in a crisis. And I learned that the best and worst comes out in people uh, during these times. And so I'm not, um, I, I'm, I, I bring to this crisis something that I learned in the last one. I think that's one of the things we all could learn is, is, is if you talk to people who have been through things, there's a lot of wisdom there and you can learn from that as you go. And I also like to think a lot about my time in the ER. You know, I worked for 18 years in an ER um, and, um, you learn every day to deal with crisis. And, and it's the same principles there on a very micro level, right? You have a trauma place, patient rolls through the door, and how, how is everyone gonna react? Not all doctors react the same. Not everyone relies on teams like they should. Um, sometimes you see people, you know, you look around and there's, they're, out, they're out in the hallway. They, they don't do well during those crises. So I think going into this one, I, we, we saw this one coming a little differently than the others. Um, the financial crisis last time, I think really, uh, you know, the, the subprime mortgages, the, the Lehman Brothers shutting down, it happened so quickly and so much was out of our control. This time I felt like a little was more in my control because I was a doctor and I thought, oh, I've treated H1N1. You know, I was in those tents at, at Meridian. I know how to do this. I know how to make a difference here. And I watched it march across the country and I watched it come to Idaho and I watched Blaine County. I had some really, really good friends in Blaine County working in the ER. And I was talking to them every day. How are you doing? What are you seeing? Um, but what I'll tell you is uh, there's so much we still don't know. <laughs> you know, I think we do the best we can with the information we have, but there's so much we still don't know about the virus, about the illness, about what we should be doing or what, we, what we're going to need to be doing in three to four months. So uh, I would tell you that um, as, as, as well prepared as I thought I was for this, there's a lot that I don't know yet. And every day I wake up and I, and I think to myself, okay, what can I learn today? Who can I listen to? What can I be reading you know, where is my source of truth today? Because we still don't know. We, we still have to get our economy back up and running. We have to get back to school. We have to get back to the fall and we don't know what's gonna happen. So um, I, would, I would say to start this forum, uh, boy, being a good listener and listening to folks and trying to find a true source of, of, of truth, right? Because there's so, much, there's so much out there that's just not accurate. Um, so that's been one of the things that I've really tried hard to do this time is to listen. Um, I've been pretty actively against some of the other nonsense that's going on out there too, because it, it, what, what a horrible time to have misinformation for people. Um, I, I can't think of anything more destructive than during a crisis to prey on some of the things that are going on. So um, I, I was probably a rambling answer to your question, but I think might set up this forum well, which is just, there's a lot that we need to listen to and there's a lot we don't know and we're all doing our best 
And the other word I'd use is grace, is um, if there was ever a time in our life we needed grace, because we're all, I mean, we're, we're, we're building this plane as it's flying, because we've never been through anything like this before. So we got to give each other grace on decisions that are made and mistakes we make. And it's not going to be perfect, because it's a crisis. <laughs> uh, that's the definition. So um, th that, that's my intro. That's actually, you bring up a really good um, a parallel to entrepreneurship here, Tommy, because what you're talking about is leading, making decisions in the absence of complete information, right? So the crisis has brought that onto us. Entrepreneurship, especially for early stage ventures, is very similar, right? People and um, founders and, 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 and anyone who's involved in the startup is really operating in an environment where information A isn't perfect and it's not complete, but yet they have to figure out ways to um, make decisions. And, and, and so what I'm hearing you saying is, is as, you, as you become better at listening, you know, these past crises that you went through, they, they've made you a better listener. You know, one of the things that I can appreciate of what you're touching on is the source of truth, right, in, in, in a moment like this. And for entrepreneurs, that's very difficult um, to manage. You know, we have our mentors, we have, we have business leaders in our lives that, that can coach us, but, you know, very rarely do they come with the same kind of pedigree that Tommy Alcos comes and has that ER experience. And so, um, no, I want to thank you for that answer. It's, it's becoming a better listener is, is definitely an actionable item for, for all of our listeners. Well, and I'll tell one more thing to add on is when I start, I started several businesses, but I started a tech company in 2001. I sold it last year, so I owned it for 18 years. And I think of how many times during that process back, you know, you start 01, how many times we rebuilt databases, what we didn't know. And as we started the business, we thought we were headed this way and it changed five or six different times. You had to be nimble, but it was listening. It was collecting good data. It was believing numbers. It was, it was listening to, to, to the math behind what we were doing and profitability that got us where we were going. So I think there's a lot of parallels with how we're handling this crisis to entrepreneurship and leadership in general. You will find that good leaders come to the top during crisis and, and good leaders in business. There's, there's a reason people are successful. It's usually hard work. It's listening and it's and making good decisions. So I think I, what you just said was, was spot on. Great. Uh, thank you, Tommy. Um, this next question, uh, I'm going to direct to Mayor McLean. Um, you know, in the, the rare occasion that I'm reading non-COVID news these days, uh, there have been some really interesting pieces um, about breakthrough innovations. Um, one in particular by Mike Maples, who's a Bay Area investor. And he talked a lot about... Um, an alternative to forecasting, which he termed as backcasting. And essentially in describing the way that entrepreneurs will um, envision a, an outcome that they desire, a future state that they want to create. And then from that, start to look backwards and think, what are the steps that I need to take in order to uh, get to this ideal state of the future? Uh, so, so with that as a premise and also an assumption that 12 to 18 months from now uh, will be in a, a different world in, in some way, shape, or form, uh, whether it's in higher education, municipal government, healthcare uh, development. Um, what are some of the things that, that you or maybe you've empowered your team to do, uh, the steps that you're taking now uh, to work towards that, that vision of the future that you would like to see? Um, thanks, Nick, for that question. Really appreciate it. And thanks also to Boise State's, um, I'm going to butcher the word, so I'm going to look at it, the College of Innovation and Design, where um, Nick's at, of course, and Trailhead for bringing us together. You know, it's it's it always been interesting to me when there are groups of people, like the group out of San, um, the Bay Area now talking about backcasting, that are really just looking at things that people have always done, but giving it cool names. And so... I mean, I've always, I've always said I'm a backwards thinker, which means like you get, you, you have a sense of where you want to be or you want your team to be. And then you work backwards and determine how you get there. And, um, and even through this, and then also thinking about it too, just when you do that backcasting as they call it now, you know where you're gonna get eventually. You have a sense of 
what you have to do, but like entrepreneurs as well, things come at you. So like thinking about it is, you know, you're trying to run a trail and finish the race without falling over and you kind of take anything that comes at you, anything you have to jump over, knowing that you want to be at one place. And so this crisis is kind of that in real life. My team here, the team at the city knows that it, our vision is around a 21st century city for everyone, where there, we, can, we support people in building, econo creating economic opportunity, and more opportunities for people throughout the city, and with a, uh, also with a lens of equity. And this crisis has presented a challenge, like real world challenges, but it's also, if you stay focused on the long-term vision, it's creating opportunities to iterate and innovate that'll ultimately still get us and maybe even more quickly to the place that we had hoped to be. And I wanna pick up on something that Tommy said too, just in terms of how this time requires um, leaders in government and business and universities everywhere else to innovate. And you really connect these principles of entrepreneurship to the work we do daily because we have to be um, comfortable with unknown. And we need people right now that will build partnerships, um, but speak clearly about you know, the situation we're in and the, tru the truth of what we're looking for, and also the truth that we don't know what's next, and feel comfortable um, taking risks and maybe learning that something we tried didn't work, and so we're gonna try something differently. And all of that still um, with this backcasting model um, fits into that if we stay true and focused on the long-term vision and then it, the steps that we want to take around that will be dictated by strategy and tactics but also um, by responding quickly um, and nimbly to the situation that presents itself. Thank you. Uh, President Trump, any, any thoughts to add to that? The backcasting, reverse engineering, you can call it 10 different things. Uh, but any thoughts to add? Yeah, actually, it's interesting because um, what I asked my leadership team to do, so when we um, first began to face the crisis, and of course, in higher ed, this presented an immediate challenge. Um, how do we suddenly, when we can't meet in person and our model has historically been based upon um, students being face-to-face -face with each other and with their faculty, and you think about things like a science lab or an art studio and the ways in which um, that's built around that physical space and suddenly we can't be there. Um, I, I had gathered people together when we were watching it, as Tommy was saying, this is a wave you could see coming. You didn't know exactly what it was going to look like, but you could see the wave coming. So we began to gather our faculty together to say, what could you do? If you had to move remotely, what, what could you do? But I think just as important to reacting to the immediate moment, um, what I did is I gathered our leadership team and I actually had them engage in an exercise. It was a, a sheet everyone had to fill out. They had to, they had to name what their mission was in less than three sentences and, and, and really articulate it. Like, what do you do? What does your unit do? And then they had to say, what do you do now in this world? How do you achieve that end in this different world? And then, and then I had, I asked them to do essentially, um, uh, what the mayor is describing. And I described it as a learning process. So Tommy's talking about it as a listening process. I described it as a learning process. How can you learn something in this moment that helps you become better at achieving that mission? And so think about what your ideal looks like. How do you use this moment and the challenges of this moment to actually leverage the challenge is now to get you there. And so a lot of people started reorganizing their units and thinking about like, okay, so I'll give you a specific example. We have an event called Bronco Day. That's, um, uh, if, if you think about it in entrepreneurial terms, right? Those are our customers. We get hundreds and hundreds of students on campus and that the yield of that day for students matriculating on campus is around 84%. So it has a huge impact on our enrollment in the fall. Well, it was suddenly eliminated. We couldn't do what we'd always done. So it went completely virtual. But what it taught our team is that we have students, for example, who might live in Florida or New York or, or Georgia or 
Nebraska who might find it difficult to get here for that day. But if we always pair a virtual Bronco day with that live experience in the future, we're going to act, we're going to be able to engage more students in that experience and it's changing the way that we think. So if, if we can learn things from this experience, but also use it as a lever to launch us forward. Um, I heard a, a CEO say recently that um, when he came to the area, he expected as a new CEO to take six years to achieve certain outcomes. He said to me recently, we're going to do it in six months because this disruption has actually shaken so many things loose that it's gonna allow us to advance on these efforts much more quickly. So I think even though it's a hard time, it's a difficult time, it's economically difficult, there's so much that's unknown, it's actually also a moment where you can ask some big questions and advance some, advance some really exciting things that can positively transform your organization. And so um, for me, I really immediately wanted to set up work groups that were going to ask people to think forward in those ways. And, and they've done some incredible work. And that, that feels exciting to me, even while we're dealing with these challenges. President Trump, if, if I may follow up on, on, on this, um, you know, you, you've just described um, a, a, the internal process at Boise State and what you've done with your leadership team. So, you know, I've watched Boise State um, play a key role as an economic um, development engine, really, in the Valley and beyond. And, and as an alumni, um, you know, I take great pride in the impact that Boise State has, has made on our community here. And, and as such, as, as, as being such an important player in this ecosystem, you know, the business community looks to Boise State as a partner and as an anchor now, tomorrow, and in the months and years to come. The question I have for you is, what signals do you want to send to the business community on behalf of Boise State as we face this pandemic together? Thank you for asking that question. I think it's a great question. Um, what I have told people is I've met with groups around the university and it's very interesting. Locally, the steps we've taken financially, I think, have, have been difficult and jarring for people. We've had furloughs. We've eliminated year-long contracts. But that's what I, when I met with our professional staff about that, move. Um, what they, we had a conversation, I explained to them, um, it's going to give us a lot more nimbleness. We're going to be able to make choices if we're not locked into something that's really um, in, inhibiting our flexibility. And so they supported that effort. And, and what I have, I've met with other presidents around the country in a number of venues. And what I've told them is take steps now that ensure your flexibility, because that's actually going to let you rebound more strongly down the road. Like when people lock down and, and get afraid to take steps right now, I think that um, uh, they're going to be less flexible when they're facing challenges ahead. Um, so what I would say to our business community is we intend, Boise State intends to come out of this stronger. And we're going to continue to bring talented students and talented leaders and entrepreneurs onto our campus. We're going to continue to grow innovative programs. And, and our, we're taking tough steps now so that we're more flexible down the road. We're ready to rebound. And we're here, it, it's programs like this, thanks to um, both of our groups today that have, have worked to bring this together, that this is a part of what Boise State is about, is we want to connect with businesses to help them thrive. And one of the very first things we did is we set up um, small group consultancies. We set up CID and the College of Business. We're working quickly. Our College of, of Health Sciences and our library and our engineering college were working with the healthcare community. We, we were trying to figure out how do we serve at this time? So we aim to be here for you, but, but if we can be bold now, we're more likely to be resilient later. So you, you, bring, up a, you bring up a key, a key word here, resiliency. And I wanna um, bring, bring the mayor into this discussion as we talk about resiliency. You know, you, know, you talk about um, your role in the community and, and really surviving in order to thrive, right? So I'd like to hear from Mayor McLean with respect to you know, the, the state of the city and, and what the city is doing to ensure um, resiliency through being nimbleness, nimble and having the ability um, to be flexible in decision making. If I could get, uh, Mayor McLean, if I could get your take on that, that would be great. 
Sure, there's a couple of things on that I'd love to talk about. You know, I, as, as there's, the, there's two pieces in the role that I'm in. There's the internal piece of working with teams to get things done. Um, and then of course the external piece of partnering with people throughout this community, whether it be businesses, um, service providers, hospitals, et cetera, in this time. And I think about resiliency in a couple ways. Of course, there's often, you'll think about it in terms of the environmental impact, um, resilience piece, but I think that's incredibly tied to, um, or intricately tied to the resilience of people and community in general. And we see in the, as individuals, someone that has had a really tough go, that's made it through a crisis, um, that has found success in life, you can usually point that to close partnerships and support, like connection to people. And I believe that as we move through this crisis and get on the other side of it and rebound, it'll require the same thing. So if we want to see resilience in our community, it's important um, that we build on the partnerships that exist, um, but particularly the connection that people have to each other, and then seek ways for people to come together, partner, and move us forward. And there's also the question now, and I'll say this to our team here at the city, you know, if we've gone through this tough time and we've gone through this crisis, and so we're budgeting right now, and, we, and we're saying, well, we had all these plans, so we're gonna keep going with them and not recognize that this crisis has created a pivot point at which we look at where we were, um, what's come new out of where we are now, and think about how we take that and innovate for the future. And I believe it's the communities that do that, do that, um, that build on partnerships and connection of people um, in their planning, um, and then think and reimagine what the future looks like from an economic perspective. And if they do, if the communities that do all that together will be the ones that thrive and are much more resilient after this and whose economies will come together first. And there's so many investments that all of us need to make in creating economic opportunity for our valley. And at this point for the city, we're looking at it and saying, okay, how do we take, what, what do we do with legacy programs that might not serve a need anymore? And then how do we instead redirect those resources in smart investments rather than just pulling back, investing all together so that we're connecting with people, partnering with the business community and investing in smart ways to achieve that both like personal, economic and long-term environmental resilience that I think creates economic opportunity for everyone. Tommy, can I get you to comment on, on this point of resiliency uh, that the mayor just brought up in terms of uh, you know that giant development you got going on out there in Meridian on uh, on Ten Mile. You know, as, as you look at that as a development and the businesses that you look to attract and, and building that community out there. You know, what what are some of the things that are going through your head when you think about resiliency over the next you know two to five years when it comes to that specific development that you're working on? Yeah. So so one of the things that we did with our team, and first of all, we have an incredible team. I think we had. We attract, you know, folks that are like-minded, that are really uh, out there to make a difference in the world and to work hard and do things that are great. So it's not really hard to motivate them. Um, but I pulled our whole team together when this was coming and we said, hey, listen, we will be stronger out the back end of this. And we are going to take this time, instead of being paralyzed, we are going to take this time and be aggressive as, as, as aggressive as we can to one, make our company better because we were going so fast before this that a lot of processes could just be uh, tightened up. So we actually had a subcommittee that said, hey, I want you to meet with every one of our departments in our company and I want you to get ideas from everyone how we could be better coming out the back end. And, and Ton did that. He met with everyone and he put together a whole structure. That was his job to make BVA better coming out the back end. We had another team that said, I want you to look for opportunity. What, what, what's, what's laying out there that we, we are not seeing right now because every single time there's disruption and, and chaos like this, there are tremendous opportunity to move forward. And then on the finance side, um, we, you know, I didn't know it'd be COVID-19, but my goodness, for two years, the number one thing on our agenda was let's prepare for the next recession. And we did every month, we sat in our meetings saying, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Are we ready? Is our financial house in order? Do we have cash? set aside so that we can take advantage of opportunity. We were ready for this. Now, I had no idea that it would be COVID-19, but we were ready for this recession because we're ready to come out the other end stronger. And so we, uh, you know, I'm almost sometimes embarrassed to say what we've done as a company. 
We have started another company. We've started a whole new business out of this. We are stronger than ever. Our internal processes are better. And, and our whole team is revved up and ready to go. Um, we communicated. Uh, we had an entire part of a subcommittee that was a communication committee. And we said, we want to reach out to every one of our tenants, potential tenants and partners, and tell them we're going to be okay. We're ready for this. Follow us. Watch us. Because what we're doing is what you should be doing with your company to survive this. And that's, that's certainly what's happened. We've stayed in communication with them. We've seen very few of our tenants uh, uh, that were coming to projects uh, struggle. We've communicated a lot. We've talked about what their, what their issues are and how we could help them and partner with them. I learned a lot during the last recession because I was still an ER doctor working. I was working 12, 14 shifts a month. And when Lehman Brothers collapsed and, and the banks pulled all our loans from Portico, where Buffalo Wild Wings is on Fairview and Eagle Road, we were just, we were done. Um, I, I, I thought there is no way out of this. And I think for the first time in my life, I thought, I think I've completely ruined my life. And I, I, I remember specifically one morning driving home from a night shift and sitting in my driveway thinking, I don't, I can't go on. And I found a way through that. And what I learned about myself and what I learned about those I surrounded with, we didn't default on one loan. We went and communicated to everyone and said, we're going to fight our way through this. We're going to make it happen. We're not going to, we're not going to default on any of our relationships or our JVs that we had. And we're going to, we're going to lead through this. And that experience taught me that now I got to tell you that here's the thing while I was going through it, I'm like, man, are we really going to make it? I was wounded. I was in the fetal position. I'm like, I'm saying it, but do I really believe it? So this time going in, I'd been through that. And I told all our guys, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to put the gas down through this thing. And we're going to, we're going to lead through this thing and watch us come out the other side stronger. And that's been what's happened. I'm really, really proud of my team. Uh, we, you know, we had a team huddle every morning. We talked about what are we going to accomplish for the day. Uh, now that we're starting to come back into the office a little bit, we miss that camaraderie. We miss that energy you get in person. But now we're starting to, to filter back into the office a little bit. And, and uh, I see these disruptions that happen in our life as opportunities. Now, you got to remember, there's the human side of this, too. And there are people struggling out there. And that's the other thing we challenged everyone in our office to do is, hey, you know, foot on the gas here. Let's let's be positive and upbeat and go do this. But let's also be empathetic and remember there are people suffering. So reach out to all the nonprofits you have relationships. Try to find some service opportunities in the community. Let's not forget that there are people that are less fortunate than us. They're not going to be able to just put their put their foot on the gas. They need help. And I'm really proud of that. That that was part of what we've done too. So you know, I think that I feel really good about where we are. I don't I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in the next two months, let alone three, four, five months. Or I mean, anyone that thinks they do, they just don't know. Um, they, they don't know. So I think we just need to be cautious. I look at the leadership of Mayor McLean. She knows this. I've told her this personally. Decisive, clear leadership from day one. If you go back from day one of this thing, I, and, you know, brand new to being a mayor, and, and I've watched her lead. Same thing with Dr. Trump. That's what we need to do. We just need to be together, communicate and lead because we don't know, make the best decisions we can, take care of those who are less fortunate than us. And we're going to get through this as a community. We're going to get through it as a university. We're going to get through it as a city. We're going to get through it as a company, as a family, as an individual. But, but there's a lot to learn about leadership through these, these trials. So, <clears throat> Tommy, maybe point on that, that thread a little bit. Uh, and, and you touch on some of this, but you know, your team that you have, um, you know, and I, I know some of those folks like Ryan Cleverly and others that are just top notch. But as you think about who you surround yourself with uh, and, and what you yourself aspire to be in, in situations like these, what leadership styles uh, do you see as most effective in these types of situations? And, and what does this type of situation, what's the type of leader that it shines a light on? That's, that's really easy for me. It's authenticity. I mean, an authentic, honest leader. So go back to the ER experience, right? When you had a vulnerable patient coming in, a trauma patient to say, I'm scared. This is hard. Let's go take care of this patient together. And you don't try to hide that. I think people want you to be honest. They want you to be authentic and they want to know you care. And so that was the, that was the message to our team. Hey, I don't know what this is going to be like. I have no idea what we're going to go into. I don't know what our tenants are going to do. I don't know what our business is going to do, but I do know this. They're going to be looking for leadership and it's going to start with us. And so be positive, be upbeat, be, be, be your best every single day. 
and let's do this thing together. So I think, I think it's authenticity. The older I get, actually, that's probably the first word that comes out of my mouth every time anyone asks me a question. I believe that authenticity wins the day. I think people that are in it for the right reason, that comes through. I think it's hard to fake things. And I think if you're authentic and true and you show your vulnerabilities and you communicate with people and you lead with passion, you show a vision, a plan, where you're headed, uh, that, that wins over every time to any other thing you'll read in a book or, or hear or, or listen to anywhere else. President Trump or Mayor McLean care to, to add to that, just the, the qualities that you look for in your leadership team? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, you know, cause I actually, we wrote it on a whiteboard sometime in February, what I was looking for. And it's what I look for in choosing like the team closest to me. Cause I have to say the department heads, the civil servants in the city are incredible. They are, they see their job as a vocation, a calling to serve their community. Um, and so I see it as my job to create a team around me that supports them, but also inspires them um, through tough good times and bad. And so for me, when I think about what I'm looking for in hiring people that can help um, not only implement the vision, but give voice to the vision is um, an ability to communicate a willingness to be curious and ask questions, to not be afraid to push back. And I want people that'll take risks, uh, measured risks in smart ways that, you know, we, I often will say like, let's fail forward, like try something and you're gonna learn from it and then we're gonna do the next thing. And if I can find a team of people um, that have that kind of personality or approach to life and work, then I believe you can teach them, you can teach them the policy intricacies, everything else. Um, but it, it really is that type of person um, that will help me um, do what I want to do, continue to challenge me, because it's so important that I continue to be challenged and questioned, um, and then help me help the rest of the city feel comfortable doing the same. And I would add, um, uh, I, anyone who's, who's heard me speak has probably heard me talk about growth mindset. Um, uh, it's, uh, there's a Stanford researcher named Carol Dweck who's been working on, she began by researching about grit. She was trying to understand why when some people failed, and boy, for entrepreneurs, this seems so valuable to me. She was trying to understand why when some people failed or had a failure, not necessarily the grand failure, they stayed down and why some people um, picked themselves back up and moved on. She thought that she was going to discover that there was an inherent psychology in some people, that some people... Um, were just uh, more gritty and that other people were just inherently not. But what she found instead was that it was really um, about people's mindset. So it wasn't so much about their, their inherent disposition as the way they chose to think. And she identified, I'm going to um, read you the list, she identified six things. Um, and there are some problems with this model because this model doesn't take into consideration things like um, uh, cultural structures that can make it hard for people to succeed and things like that. But uh, it, it, it's really brilliant in terms of, of this mindset issue. And this is what I look for in my leadership team. The belief that your intelligence is not fixed. And, <clears throat> and Tommy's talked a lot about this today, that this idea of growth, you learn from these struggles. They don't have to take you down. That you embrace challenges that you persist in the face of setbacks, that you see effort as a pathway to mastery. So effort is not something that's futile. Effort is how you become better. Whether you're failing or succeeding, all of that effort is helping you become better. That you learn from criticism. So if somebody makes a critique of you, instead of feeling deflated by it, you say, oh, that's something I can learn. And, and that you're inspired by the success of others instead of feeling threatened by it. So when you see another organization that does it better, you say, oh, wow, that's so interesting. I can learn from that. So it's really a dispositional approach to how you face challenges and hardships. And, and I've talked, a that means as a leader, you have to be willing to take the same risks. Um, and you have to be willing to be really thoughtful and working in a formative way instead of a summative way with your own leadership team. So here's how you can use your strengths to really grow uh, in areas where you don't have strengths and, and really see it as an opportunity. So in, in many ways, the moment that this challenge presents to us really is, if we approach it with a growth mindset, really is an opportunity is, as the mayor said earlier. 
This is actually a really good segue to the next question. Um, you know, we, we, we just talked about uh, measured risks as the mayor brought up, and Tommy talked about his version of getting to resiliency by being um, aggressive or proactive and seeking out opportunities. And so, you know, the entrepreneurial mindset um, very much lives in the short term. So short term pain for long term gain is something that most early stage entrepreneurs, um, it's the, the kind of luxury we just don't have. But this crisis has really forced that kind of thinking on us. And, and Mayor McLean, if, if I could start with you and then um, ask President Trump and, and Dr. Alcos to, to um, give us their feedback on this question. But when you think about measured risks and resiliency, can, can you share the city's approach on prudently reopening the city um, while making sure that in the long term uh, you protect the people in the city. So it's, it's kind of a, um, um, a struggle of, of time versus, you know, your, your return on your, call it the investment. Entrepreneurs think of that differently. And I think they can learn a lot from uh, what the city has done to date. So can you share with us your approach on, on that? Sure. Um, so first I should share, I should say that, you know, as Tommy pointed out, I'm brand new at this. And so um, I'm learning. Um, all the time myself. And the approach, I'm going to start the answer to the approach to reopen with our decision to close and when we did. And I, we did that, I did that by um, taking in information from people all around the country um, that I knew or somebody knew or somebody else knew and the kind of the communication web just started. Um, and by rec sitting back and recognizing that we wouldn't be different than any other place how, um, in terms of how we would be hit. There's all, what makes us different in many ways is we have this eternal hope that things will be better or you know, maybe it'll be different. But, and that, so you have to kind of balance those two when you talk, we, and when we talked about early before others did, we're shutting city hall, we're closing restaurants, we're doing these things. And we did that by taking in all that information and really recognizing that we weren't gonna be any different than anywhere else. And that if we did it quickly um, and, and the right way, it would be more likely one, that we protect our health um, and two, that we would recover more quickly in the long run. And so now, um, as we've come through this, like reopening is hard. And, you know, it's, and I keep trying to remember how crummy it felt when we were closing and all the pushback that we got because it did feel crummy, but we've forgotten that because you know you learn in retrospect, it was the right thing to do. Um, and that's where we're at now is, rec I think that the indicators that the governors put together are things that we have to look at. And we need to do this in stages as the most dense community in the state um, with the most <laughs> Economic, like truly the economic impact is huge with Boise State um, being home to so many head, ah, shoot. I can see and hear you, you're still there. You can see me? Oh, I lost you, okay. Um, <laughs> suddenly it went away, so I don't see a screen anymore. I'll just not use a screen. Um, being home to so many of the um, large employers here I think it's incredibly important that we not only look at the phases that have been proposed here, um, but take things a little bit more slowly with regard to the requirements that we've put, put on reopening. So, and then we also have to balance the, I wish I could see you, the, um, oh, there you are, the inherent human nature of wanting certainty, because, especially because we've, we're living through crisis and the economic impacts that that has brought with it to so many people in this community, and that's tough. So when you see dates as potential dates for phases, you, fo you focus on that rather than on the long list of things that we have to see before we move from phase to phase, stage to stage. And so for us, we're, we plan, unless we see data locally that's different than the average state data, which is very possible given we're so dense, we'll be evaluating the same data that the state is evaluating. Um, but I fully expect that we will have um, more requirements just as we do in our order. If, if you're gonna 
um, be out and opening your business, social distancing is required. And talking with the hospitals, they've said, well, you could all, you could say, or masks required. So in phase two for just organizations that open. And we're gonna be slower when it comes to the number of people that can gather and the things that where the city has to permit, like events or activities in our parks or facilities, um, will be slower. And we made the tough, super tough call to keep pools closed because of the financial impact of opening them and with you know, not even the certainty of knowing that they could be open for more than three or four weeks at the end of the summer. And we do all that because we are focused on getting people back to work. So we're gonna have to play a little less so we can all stay healthy and work a little bit more. And then um, our goal is for it not to happen in such a way that we open the faucet um, and give it all out and then have to yank it back, but instead be a little bit more measured um, and keep the keep it closed and then lift it if the data looks good is really how we're looking at it. But for us at the end of the day, um, our goals remain the same, which is protect the health of our community and ensure that we can recover in strong and resilient ways. And we do that by minimizing this um, and really being attuned to the experience of communities ar in, across this country and around the world. Um, and the data that we're seeing here at home. And, and I would, would say too, on why this feels so tough again, is because we are all so ready to be out and about, to be back to doing the things that we used to do. And the early measures taken by the state and the cities had an impact. And so we're dealing with this crisis that seems so um, impossible because it's invisible and we didn't see the huge um, infection rates that we saw in other places. And so that makes it even harder to really um, come to grips with um, the realness of it, the reality of the situation, and the impact it could have if we go too quickly on our ability to get back to work and to make a living. So, so I, for one, I can appreciate very much the difficulty that you're bringing to everyone's attention and, and being prudent and, and uh, you know, making the decision to incur short-term pain for, for the long-term gain. And so if, if I could turn the same question then over to, to President Trump, as you think about the campus, the university, and being prudent and quote unquote reopening, what are some of the things that you are thinking about and, and who are some of the people that you are bringing to the table to help you think through those scenarios? We are, <clears throat> excuse me, we are really working hard to be um, science-driven. We're very fortunate that we have a lot of scientists on our faculty and we're able to um, work with folks to figure out what are the best practices, but we're also consulting with universities all across the country. <clears throat> and what other institutions do in the state may not look like what Boise State does, because none of the other institutions are in big metro areas, as, as Lauren has said, and, and most of their student population are, are students who are Idaho students, um, whereas about 30% of Boise State's population comes from out of state. And so what we need to really think about is how are we protecting our whole community? And that's not just internally our community, but the larger community in which we live of Boise, so that we're using mitigation practices on campus and we're developing a color coding system um, that's based on stoplights to help people um, understand uh, how, how we're going to roll out processes. And we have told them there may be um, times when we move forward and back. You know, we, we um, the way I've described it with our faculty is it's, you have to think of it like an accordion. We'll take whatever steps we can and we have to move back in. But we recognize a kind of responsibility that we have, especially since um, when, when we made the decision to, to move to remote learning on campus, what we were facing was students going home or going traveling for spring break and then coming back to campus and the risk that would pose not just to people at Boise State, but to our entire state. And so what we had to do is make a very difficult decision to ask our faculty to move those, those courses to remote learning. But we've told our faculty, if you can be flexible, this is another one of those moments where it can really be transformative for our community. If we can learn how to be really flexible in how we deliver, even though um, the metaphor I've often used with people is, I love going to the grocery store. I love picking out my own 
fruits and vegetables, but my 92 year old mother lives with me. And so for me to go to the grocery store right now is probably not the best choice. So I'm having a delivery service bring it. I've never used a delivery service for my groceries before, but right now it's the best choice for me and my family. Now, if there are times in the future when I'm traveling and my mom needs some groceries, I can actually have them sent to her because now I've accessed this service. So what I'm thinking about is the ways in which if we have a student who, for example, has to go home to work on their family farm for a couple of weeks during the semester, can we create a kind, build in a kind of flexibility that will help us be responsive to that student's needs? That would be a revolutionary way to deliver higher education. But we're going to think as a community in, in terms of our reopening model, how do we mitigate with large crowds, maybe for large lecture hall classes, we'll drive those classes to online for the lecture hall part, and then we'll bring smaller groups of students together to work with faculty and TAs. And for the smaller, for the medium-sized classes, we'll go in large rooms. For the small classes, we'll go in medium-sized rooms. So we're thinking about how we can be responsive to reduce a lot of really close contact. Um, college campuses are, are inherently structured to bring people together. And, and so what we have to do now is think about how do we do that in a way that not just protects our community internally, but protects our community externally and how can we learn from it? Yeah, one of the things you're touching on there is you know, something I've uh, come to experience as an international student at Boise State, campus life. It was you know, a big part of my overall experience and not just the academic part, but I'm, I'm really curious to see how that pans out as, as Boise State navigates um, you know, maintaining the value that students get from the campus life, and not just the academic side. Um, but Tommy, so, something tells me that you have an opinion on prudently reopening um, and, and crush the curve comes to mind. So if I can get your take on, you know, the strategies that you're considering to prudently reopen, um, what are your thoughts? So, so my thoughts are, I, I really, really hope people step back and understand that two months ago, we didn't have any testing available. So the reasons we shut were because we didn't have testing. And, and I, I will remind, we need to shout this from the rooftops. This is the same virus that's been around the world. It's not different in Idaho than it was in South Korea, than it was in Seattle, than it was anywhere else. So we don't need to reinvent any wheels here. All we need to do is look at what, what's worked at countries and cities and states that have done a really good job and what hasn't worked. And the, what, what you still don't hear people talking about, and this is why we started Crush the Curve, is testing, testing and tracing, testing and tracing, testing and tracing. All the other stuff that we do will not matter uh, unless we can test and trace people that have it. And, and to me, we're still not doing this right. Um, we, are, we are still not even talking about it right. We're sending mixed messages to people because it's not when we open, it's how we open. We should be talking nonstop about what, what does the checklist look, look like to open, but more importantly than anything else, what are you going to do when someone gets sick that you know, whether that's at home or at work or in the city, how are you going to do it differently now than you did two months ago? And that's gonna be hard for people because if you listen to people talking about even opening up for work, they're not even talking about testing and tracing. We now, through Crush the Curve, we could test 4,000 Idahoans a day for COVID-19. We're testing about 40. Okay, so, so, so we have capacity. As a state, we, we just barely passed 30,000 total since this started. If we don't change the paradigm and people don't have the rapid response teams and this idea of quickly isolating and testing and tracing people that have it, all this other stuff we're talking about won't matter. And it's still not, the clarity's still not there. We're still talking about dates. We're still talking about all this other stuff. We should be talking about what is the rapid response to testing especially on a campus, especially in a city that's the most populated, because without that, and, and the good news is we have, listen, it was, a, it was only about four and a half weeks ago that we started Crush the Curve. I can't tell you how much testing has changed in four weeks. It, it's, it's exponentially changed. You look forward two, three, four months, that's why I'm trying to say what we're, what we're going to be dealing with this fall is that's like years away compared to what's happened in the last four weeks. But we need to talk about testing and tracing every time we do, because that's what South Korea did. That's what the countries did that have opened up. And if not, you're just, if not, it's going to keep coming back up. You're going to have micro outbreaks. You're going to lose this. If you look at the problem with COVID-19 and people, we don't talk about this enough either. It, it's one thing, H1N1, you knew you had it. 
I mean, I was, I was in a tent at St. Luke's taking care of patients and someone would walk in and you could tell who had H1N1. You did. It's, there was, you weren't asymptomatic. You had flu-like symptoms, right? And you got sick. With, we're finding that 50% of COVID-19 patients are asymptomatic. The other thing that we didn't know until a week ago, we've now tested more than 10,000 Idahoans, okay, all around the state. The prevalence of IgG antibodies is less than 1.7%. And these are people that think they had it, right? We have almost no disease here. So any notion that we, we are waiting for something magical to happen, we need to, we need to talk about what are, the, what are the policies and procedures to test and trace, and what's your medical uh, maintenance of, of trying to keep people healthy. That's way more important than any time. And, and June, July, August, there, I think that the decrease in infectability is going to be about 20%, but it's still very infectious. It's still going to come. You're still going to have people coming in from out of state, Dr. Trump, that are coming from all over the country back to school. We better get that messaging right really quick because all this other stuff won't matter very soon. Just, just a quick follow-up on that. So, so one thing you brought up, Tommy, uh, checklists. Um, you know, I, I myself for Trailhead have been running around like a chicken with my head cut off trying to come up beg, borrow, and steal from all these checklists that are out there to not reinvent the wheel. And, and I'm, I'm using this opportunity for a shout out to the city for those entrepreneurs who are on the call and are now frantically putting a checklist together after what Tommy has said. I actually went to the city's website and found a recovery phase one department checklist. Now this is something the city uses internally, but I've been able to look at that. So if, you, if you're looking for resources, we're gonna share them after this call and, and getting uh, people the help and jump starting on this checklist. Um, you know, that, that said, Tommy, one of the questions, and, I, and I'm butting up against time here, but it's an important one. The, one of the questions that came up was, you know, an individual took the test and, and got, got, got the test results back um, that, that they've had uh, COVID-19 in the past. And what is your take on now what? Is, is this a false sense of security? Is this similar to us taking people's temperature and saying, hey, you don't run a fever, come on in? What's your take on that? So the, the, the IgG antibody was never a stamp of immunity. That's, that's, that's never been talked about by anybody. But, but the flip side of that, there's no data out there that says that an IgG antibody is a bad thing. With every other viral illness, having IgG is a good thing and probably means you're immune. But we don't know that yet. But what it helps us with, this is what it helps us with. It helps us with prevalence of disease in our community. Right now, we, we were flying completely blind as a community. We shut down our entire economy, and now we know that very, very, very few people have had it. The idea of getting to herd immunity in Idaho is like saying we're all going to go to the moon. It's not going to happen. We're going to have to figure out another way to navigate this because almost no one's had it yet. That's very helpful. So we make sure we tell people that when they do the antibody test, but the most important test, so antibody tests will be helpful for certain populations. So for example, for Dr. Trump in one of her dorms, if she had a baseline of what, how many people in the dorm had IgG antibodies, and then two months later tested the same dorm, she would know how many asymptomatic COVID patients seroconverted to IgG positive in a dorm setting. That, that would be very helpful for her. Now, for an individual, if you have a loved one at home, it's also very helpful for Dr. Trump to know if she had IgG because she's got a mom at home. So there's very individual reasons IgG is important and for communities. But the most important thing, and I don't want to, we've been talking about antibodies so much. The most important thing for everyone out there is get tested for the virus if you think you're sick. That's, that, the problem with the whole antibody discussions is it's, it's really distracted people from the fact that we have plenty of COVID-19 kits out there. If you can imagine this, when I started this four weeks ago, we were completely paralyzed because we didn't have swabs. A little four cent swab had shut down the United States of America. I ordered 100,000 swabs. We have 100,000 nasal collection kits now, 100,000. So any idea that we don't have enough testing, we have plenty of testing. What we need is the awareness so that people get tested when they think they have it. Thank you for providing that clarity, Tommy. Um, yeah, this question has come up in the community a number of times and uh, thank you. I, I feel like I can answer that now on your behalf if it comes up again. Well, um, I know that we're uh, already over our time. So, and I'm sure that uh, all three of our panelists have uh, places and to go and people to, to speak with. So first of all, would just like to thank uh, each of you, President Trump, Dr. Alquist, Mayor McLean, for your time today. Um, although we didn't have any 
know, dogs running into sliding glass doors or anything exciting like that. Uh, the conversation itself um, was awesome. And just appreciate the time that you took to be with us. And I think it speaks to, for me, it speaks to one of the things that makes um, Boise and this community a great place is that Boise, um, unlike many other places, if you want to be in conversation with the leaders in this community, all you have to do is ask. All you have to do is reach out. And, and I think the three of you being here today uh, just shows that, that this community is willing to come around. Uh, it's entrepreneurs, uh, it's community members and anyone in need um, and just appreciate your leadership. Uh, as we closed up with a, a talk about a, a, a partnership uh, like Crush the Curve, uh, serving others in our community, it kind of gets me thinking about our next week's discussion. Uh, we will have guests from the City of Good, uh, which is uh, an organization that is putting, putting restaurant workers back to work and feeding those in need. Uh, and we'll also have some guests which from the COVID, um, COVID Cultural Commissioning Fund, uh, a partnership between uh, Tree Fort, the City of Boise, and Boise State. Uh, and, and I think we're going to shift our, our mindset a little bit to think about not only how we, we survive, but also we serve others uh, during this challenging time. Um, so again, thank you to all that joined us uh, and thank, thank you. you to our panelists. Uh, we greatly appreciate you and, and hope that you all uh, have a great day and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you for your leadership. Thank you all. Take care, everybody. Bye for now. <laughs>